Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker and designer, Dirk Pinkerton. You probably know Dirk's design work. He's very prolific from Kaiser to Concept to Beyond EDC's asymmetric line. He's designed many folders for some of the finest manufacturers in the world, developing a signature utilitarian style. And I got to say, making the most of the Warncliffe blade shape. Uh, But you may not know that he is also a custom maker of fixed blades, beautiful purpose-driven knives that tend towards the ethnographic and exotic, garnering massive respect from both collectors and fellow makers. I own a few Pinkerton designs and one custom that is definitely a highlight of my collection, and I hope to see those ranks swell uh, of my Pinkerton sub-collection. We'll see how that goes, Uh, and we'll find out about what Dirk has cooking for us in the offing, but first... uh, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen on the go. And as always, join us on Patreon and uh, see what we have to offer you. We got uh, extras uh, of interviews. We've got knife giveaways and oh, so much more. So check us out on thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Dirk, welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Good to have you back, sir. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, I feel like congratulations are in order, but maybe not in any on any specific front because you have a lot of fronts. Uh, but one of them, uh, this asymmetric line uh, from Beyond EDC, this contact, uh, your newest or one of your newest. I mean, like I said in the intro, you're very prolific. You have a lot of designs on different companies but this asymmetric contact is so sweet um you really to me have the worn cliff uh on lock but but this one in particular uh is firing in all cylinders for me uh, so congratulations on all of this design success thank you very much i appreciate it it's uh it uh it doesn't feel uh like it's a lot of success but uh you know i guess that's I guess that's just that weird perception on being on this side of it and uh, knowing what all you put into it. And uh, it, it, you know, like I said, it's just kind of weird. <laughs> it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel uh, like it's that big of a deal. Yeah. Well, you know, I could see, uh, I could see how it's sort of like uh, you work at the pizza shop, you come home, you make amazing pizza, but you don't feel like eating it. It's uh, might be a similar sort of thing. I mean, you're, you know the hard work that goes into designing all these knives and uh, and making them unique, uh, uh, you know, same but different, and and making them uh, Pinkerton. Well, like, well, how would you define your style? Uh, I haven't defined my style yet. Um, I'm still kind of searching, uh, just looking to see what uh, what fits me. Um, just kind of growing and going with uh, with what suits my fancy. Um, so yeah, I don't personally feel that I have a defined style. Other people say I do, but I, I personally don't think I do. Well, I think that uh, maybe the style, it, you have uh, different looks, you have a number of Warncliffe designs, and then you have some clip point designs, and uh, this new Navaja that you that you have coming out uh, uh, in uh, from Beyond EDC is really cool, and 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 a departure from some of of your work unless you start looking at your fixed blade knives which we'll talk about <clears throat> but let me uh please allow me to define your style as i see it um i i see your work as being very utilitarian um but definitely with a with a tactical mind to it and and yes that is the filter through which i see things the lens uh but 
but I look at this knife and it has the utility of a Warncliffe, but a little bit more with that forward angle. I've been talking a lot about the forward angle on this blade. Um, tell me what went into designing this knife in particular and you know what you were what you were hoping to get out of this. This one actually started uh, in a conversation with uh, David's son with Beyond EDC looking for a nice gentleman style knife that would be uh, easy to carry, tactical, but not over the top tactical. And um, kind of what you were saying with, uh, with something of my, uh, my design style or where I, my head is at the time. And um, it actually started, the, the idea started with the uh, Kaiser, or I should say Tangram Orion um that basic uh silhouette is what i was looking at initially uh to get that design and it just kind of flowed from there um started drawing influence looking at the uh indo-persian uh pesh cabs uh some of those knives i've always been intrigued by them and i saw an opportunity to incorporate some of that attitude if not exact design into this uh, knife. And that's kind of where the, uh, the upswept, uh, Warncliffe came from, uh, was that idea of trying to, to get that, uh, that Pesh cabs, uh, T back, uh, penetrating blade. And then, uh, not wanting it to be completely limited to the, just that. So we kept the, uh, the Warncliffe, uh, intact instead of trying to make it more of a, that uh, dagger style or piercing style or rondel rondel dagger style blade that the the pesh cops kind of has that very narrowly focused uh blade and uh yeah it just it evolved from there and it just so happened that the uh, the tangram handle the, the orion handle was uh the perfect uh home for that blade oh interesting i had the uh i had the orion and um, I believe I gave that one to my brother. Um, another regret, you know, I have a lot of them when it comes to my knife collection. But uh, <laughs> so that's no longer with me. <laughs> but I can see the spirit of it, uh, especially. And, and you mentioned the, the handle design definitely there. But also in the blade, um, you, you make a lot of, well, two of the fixed blades I have in front of me. One of this one is mine. You made this the cave bear. It is a Pical uh, style uh, knife. You, you've made the, you did the Kaiser inversion, a folding Pical style knife, which I think is really cool and beautiful. And I love, uh, I love this carry and it's way, way more of a utility knife than people actually give it credit for. Very true. Um, uh, but, um, with the with the con just getting back to the contact real quick, I noticed immediately with the upswept Warncliffe, uh, there are a few knives that have that sort of upswept. I think Hinderer makes one that has kind of an upsweep uh, to the Warncliffe, one of the smaller ones. But what what that results in, especially with that with that neutral handle shape, is if you if you do need to put this gentleman's knife. I mean, to me, it's a you know it's a classy sculpted, nicely milled, anodized handle. Everything about it is so sweet and. And gentlemanly, but if you have to get ungentlemanly with it and you put it in a reverse grip, it, it does make for a great pickal because the upsweep of that blade equals the reaching out angle that you need in a pickal style knife. So, exactly. uh, yeah, I, I see a lot in this design in particular. That um, That is something that I've found that happens a lot of times. There are uh, designs that come together and uh, allow for a multifunctional use uh, gives you multi purpose where you can use it in any grip any angle that you need to so in this case as i said it was a, it, the idea originated through the pesh cobs uh, but as uh, as it developed with that warncliffe and that angle it uh, it almost matches exactly the pacal style blades and um yeah just with that neutral handle it just uh, fits pretty much any way you use it so i sometimes like i i've been told a few times that it's uh when a design is well thought out especially if you're going for a multi-use knife 
that it lends itself to literally multiple functions, not just what you think of as a day-to-day multi-use knife. I mean, literally, pakal, self-defense, utility, you name it, it, it'll give you what you want if it's a, a well-thought-out design. So I like to think that uh, I put forward a well-thought-out design there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say you did uh, um, because it has that. I mean, to me, I always come back to, um, and I, I I berate myself as being kind of shallow about this, but I love the way if a knife doesn't look good to me, it's, it's, it's probably going to get left behind. Like, I love the PM2 for its utility, but to me, it's just not the looker, you know, so I'm not I'm not going for that. Uh, right. I, I'm going for that when I'm painting, you know, painting the bedroom. You know, that's that's a good, great utility knife. But the looks so so you got all of that stuff you were talking about, uh, plus the looks. And that is important, uh, as you did with the inversion with this sort of terraced um, titanium. The handle is really cool that. And you're expecting the blade to be oriented in the opposite way. That's just what our eyes are used to when we see that familiar choil set up. Exactly. Um, but what you get is a Pical style knife that you can wave out of your pocket. But what a great utility knife this is. Cutting straps, uh, using, you know, opening boxes, uh, everything like that. This isn't a straight tactical knife. Uh, tell me about coming up with this particular design, this folder and and how this worked and and how you got it into the hands of kaiser and got them to say yes well kaiser was uh, fortunately uh worked out pretty easy because uh this started when david was still there so mm -hmm. he was eager to see something new and different uh come into <laughs> kaiser so that part was kind of easy um i pitched the idea to him he said okay let's see it and it took me a while to work out getting the blade upside down, uh, getting it to uh, function correctly, getting it to lock correctly, uh, getting the flipper to work without being in the way, um, all that fun stuff. And once I gave him the basic silhouette, he's like, all right, finish it off. Let's, you know, let's dress it up a little bit. And that's where I drew a complete blank. Um, and it took me a while and I finally thought back, you know, like, what have I seen in the past that would look good on this? And Brian, I believe it was Brian Ty, one of his folders from uh, early 2000s, he did, if I remember correctly, I think it was Brian Ty, did a stepped or terraced handle. And, you know, that's where it popped out. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's borrow from that. And we'll do a, we'll do that terraced handle. That way it gives it a three-dimensional feel. Uh, gives it a little bit of a look and, um, you know, looking back, if I had thought about it a little further, I probably put some micro milling in, in the steps just to give it a little extra grip. But, uh, yeah, I think it, uh, it turned out pretty nice. That's interesting uh, because the micro milling on the chamfers of the contact are great. Are, they're amazing for grip. And that works well. Titanium, uh, especially if it's polished or you're, you know, smooth, Titanium isn't necessarily the grippiest material, and that, that's what I was going to mention uh, about this, about the terracing of the uh, inversion, for instance. You know, this is, if you think about the real use of this, you know, the ghastly use of this, if, it's, if, if you're going there, uh, you know, your hands might be getting wet, so to speak. And so to have uh, something that your fingers are gripping onto other than just the contours and the contours work well, <clears throat> but the handle itself has to be small to make the whole thing work because you got to have your thumb up there. So to have that terracing is kind of essential uh, because your hands might be sweaty. You might be nervous if you're using this, they might get, you know, wet, whatever. Uh, so yeah. yeah, that, that sort of um, solution ended up working well, I think. I, yeah, I think so too. I've uh, gotten a few uh, reports from people who have used it in various applications um, without the gory details, and they say it has functioned very well. Um, no issues with grip, deployed easily, and uh, performed as advertised. Yeah, so uh, this, it is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, this is a gentleman's version of like, say, the, um uh, the elvia or something it's it's the it's the gentleman's version of a very very uh purpose-driven 
weapon tool type thing. But again, like I said, it isn't. It's kind of like a piece of kinetic art that can make an excellent weapon, but is also a very good EDC uh, for just utility, this inversion. Kinetic art. I, I like that. I, <laughs> I'm still, I still get uh, uh, taken aback a little bit when people talk about uh, my designs as art. Um, I, it just never enters my mind that it's in that category. So, you know, when you, when you say that, it just kind of like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this in particular, that's what I'll say to the police if they ever say, what the hell is this? It's kinetic art, sir. <laughs> You'll like uh, this. That, is that, that might not work. <laughs> no, they'll say thank you. This is my kinetic art now, and they'll walk off with it. Um, so, so you're you were saying um, now. Now, just to be clear, I this is kinetic art, but but I think they, that that uh, art uh, by definition cannot have a use other than being appreciated. So yours are are the the height of design, but they can be definitely used. And now, now I'm thinking the, the work of yours that is the most artful to me are your fixed blades. Uh, you know, I'm just looking at this, I'm looking at the, the, the incredibly precise grinds you put in your blades. I'm talking about uh, the overall profiles of them. And then I'm talking about the ethnographic uh, inspiration in your knives. Um, in incredible, you just posted one just today uh, as uh, as we're recording this, I saw it like an hour ago, and it was this curvy double-edged blade mamiya. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, hamiya. Hamiya. Um, yeah, that is uh, basically it means with honor. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's based on the um, the jambia. Uh, so it's just a, a small version of it. So it's uh, just one of my takes on that knife. Um, I have a larger version and a small version. Um, and, uh, it's through, through my exploration of a lot of these designs, um, it strikes me that as I'm putting my own interpretation on it, and then I start really looking back at the original design, I sometimes, uh, look at uh, what I did and think I actually messed up the original design, uh, because those designs have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, though hundreds of years in this case. And um, yeah, they, they probably got it right because they use it every day. And <laughs> but in this case, I think it actually turns out turned out quite nice. I think the, the lines flow very well. Um, I think it's uh, to me personally, it's very striking. Uh, I, every time I make one, I want to keep it. Uh, so uh, one of these days I might indulge myself and make one for myself. But um, yeah, it's, this is one that I've, I'm really liking a lot, and uh, it's slowly starting to catch on. People are starting to pick it up and uh, really uh, get into the look. Um, when you do a Persian upswept blade and you try and go to the original look of the, the Kanjar or the, uh, the Jumbia, um, people don't always get into it. They like the more Western trailing point version that's a little more... Uh, uh, narrow and um, a lot less. I don't know the right word for it. It just leaves a little bit less to the imagination in my mind when I see some of the uh, modern interpretations of Persian blades. Um, so I'm hoping that as I make some more, get those out there, it'll start gaining a little traction and more people will appreciate that look or that style, the broader blade and that uh, more abrupt upturn uh, trailing point. What uh, benefit in um, self-defense or uh, tactical applications do you think that sort of Persian style of blade has? The primarily, I think it's the uh, it's going to be the the, the upswept blade, or if you flip it over the hawk bill, or if it's mm -hmm. not that upswept, then you have a you know slightly curved uh, Warncliffe. Uh, that's where I think most of the the tactical function comes from it um, because you're going to use that for, uh, you know, the self-defense aspect, the more aggressive cuts that you need to make. And then the, uh, the curved or the belly of the blade on the opposite side is going to be more for your day-to-day -day chores. Cause a lot of these knives were carried as, as tools, as, you know, as a day-to-day mm -hmm. -to -day tool. Um, 
a lot of the tribesmen would carry them and and that's what they had with them kind of like uh sacks uh for the norsemen you know that was their day-to-day -day tool that they carried that did every everything they needed to do so it, it's kind of their version of that um so that's uh that's how i see it and that's my understanding of the overall design of it um and it is very effective in that i tested it out on some uh, inert media and it cuts very very well yeah that uh just the hawk bill portion in a slash is just you know horrifying even even with an unsharpened swedge on a bowie you can you can get some pretty um you know substantial damage and now uh, you talk about adding an edge to it and making it as keen as say uh that inner edge and uh you know it is but that's interesting i i, I never uh, knew that about uh the jambia or or those uh persian knives that the one edge the curved edge was used for daily chores and such uh, but the other edge for fighting just because it makes more sense in a in a slash where did your love or interest in the world's knives uh come from exotic knives and ethnographic knives it just slowly developed as i just started um looking into as i was getting into knife making and looking into various knives that i would see you know started with bowies primarily and um the uh, the Bowie, you know, kind of led into where did the Bowie come from? What were the origins of the Bowie? And that took me to the Navaja, and it took me to the uh, the Kanjar and the uh, Jambia. And then after that, I started really looking around at all the different blades in the, in the world, um, different countries, different uh, areas of the world throughout history. And uh, yeah, just kind of evolved from that original uh interest in the bowie the bowie i love it because that's an ethnographic weapon too it's just our you know it's our it's where we're from exactly i, I love it. and uh, you talk about the navaja that is uh, one of my all-time favorite knives i don't own one I, I really want a nicely made spanish navaja by miguel barbudo if i'm going to be uh, specific about it but oh yeah uh, yeah i i love that's okay so wait i i'm going to put that on on pause for a second Hey, uh, Jim, stop scrolling for just a second. And uh, the one on the top left was the one we were just talking about this. Uh, uh, no, the one up from there. Oh, well, that's cool, too. That's a sax. Just like what you were talking about. Look at those. So the one right there. Look at that. So is that GL Hansen and Sons uh, uh, G Carta? There? It is. Oh, yeah, my it God. is. This thing is beautiful. And you've got that incredible Cerakote on there, uh, like uh, like on my cave bear. And uh, and both edges there are sharp, yes? That is correct, yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. So this is a, this is a dream knife for me. I have uh, some behind me, but I have, uh, yeah, I have a Jambia that my dad got me with a belt. It's an old one uh, on, a, on the opposite wall. I love exotic weapons also. Um, I say also in addition to these kind of things. Um, so I think I need to get maybe more <clears throat> of these uh, sort of uh, modern uh, ethnographic custom um, crossovers <laughs> that you're making. And I'm saying it publicly so that I'll be, I'll have to do it. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, well, yeah, tell you what, um, Come up with something that you really want and, uh, you know, out of history, and I'll see if I can uh, put my spin on it for you. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to be coming at you from the Philippines. Those are my favorite blades. But uh, so the um, the ethnographic weapons and, and, and then the Pakal style, how did your interest develop in that? Because that's not really any particular... Uh, culture that's that's a, a style of fighting that you know we see coming out of Mexico and and South America and, and such but but also as filtered through the states how did your interest in this develop and and how'd you get a foothold in this uh, growing market uh, early on I saw Keating's uh, draw point videos um, I thought that was really interesting. The very first time I saw it, it made a lot of sense. It felt very intuitive. Um, Wait, explain, explain what that is. Uh, draw point is basically the, the idea of any fixed blade that you have, 
uh, instead of using it in a conventional forward grip or saber grip uh, as you would for self-defense, you just draw it in the reverse grip edge in. Um, and the idea was for quick strikes, um, you know, not so much the Bacall style where you're going in and ripping out, but just quick strikes, quick penetration uh, as fast as you can. And it made more sense to me when I started looking at it from his perspective and thinking about those strikes. And then we had uh, Spiderco about that same time popped up with the PCAL mm -hmm. uh, from South Narc. And um, then it really started to click as they started, you know, I started investigating what that was about and it felt very, very intuitive. Um, and at that time I was working on uh, a neck knife called the, the variable broadhead. Um, that was a variation. Uh, it, it got started as a uh, LeGriff, uh, Fred Perrin LeGriff. Uh, a friend of mine is a uh, police officer in Columbus, Ohio. And at the time he was on the street and he always carried a LeGriff in a neck sheath. And he asked me, he's like, you know, this thing always gets twisted around. I can never get the handle oriented the way I wanted. You know, I love the knife, but as a neck knife, it just, it moves around too much. I need to come up with something that is, when I grab it, I know I'm going to have something usable regardless. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where the broadhead came from, that centrally oriented uh, handle and then the triangular dagger uh, blade. And um, so once I started seeing the draw point and the call, I started thinking about how the, uh, the broadhead would uh, work perfectly for that because of the, the very nature of what it is, very small blade angle, perfect for penetration and either a, a quick withdrawal or a ripping motion to withdraw. And, um, then I developed my, uh, claw, uh, variable claw after that specifically with that in mind. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed after that. I, every time I would, have a piece of scrap line around, I would see what I could do to make a, a Pakal style blade. Uh, I have a bunch of old scrap. I, I'll have to dig up those pictures sometime. I have a bunch of things that look like all kinds of, you know, dungeon style torture devices, uh, tools, um, just weird angles, weird grips. Um, you know, if it looked like I could put a Pakal style blade on it, turn it into something that would be good for ripping, I did it. Um, some of them looked really good. Some of them not so much, but you know, that's, that's how you learn. You go and play with those things and you, you experiment and you come up with some good ideas out, out of all that, uh, exploration. Yeah. And, and you refine along the way. It's interesting to have a, <clears throat> excuse me, to have a, um, a requirement you know like when the government puts out a requirement for a new fighter plane they'll say it's got to be stealthy it's got to be got to go mach 2 it's got to be able to hold missiles and this and that and then the companies all start to work well it's it's kind of a similar concept um you know uh this gentleman who's a police officer he wants uh something that he can grab and always have it oriented in the right way it's it's kind of great to start designing or working on something creative uh, when you have a lot of limitations uh, put on you, um, do you do you find that that's true? Uh, yeah, a lot of times I do, because um, it's uh, it's one of those things where I go through periods, and you know, it's like writing or any kind of creative uh, process where you'll have uh, you know, just this flood of ideas that you you know, like you, you don't have enough time in the day to to develop those ideas or get them on paper or get them in the computer. And then you'll go through long spells where no matter what you do, you you can't make two lines intersect um, and you have no idea how to make a knife anymore on, in drawing. You're just looking, you know, like, what am I doing? Uh, so when someone comes to me, especially when I'm in that drought and they say this, you know, this is what I need, it gives me a, a good starting point to work from. Um, and a lot of times that it's it's a it's an inspiration because I'll, I'll think away from the direction they're going. So I'll develop, you know, what they want, but it also gives me, it starts that creative juice flowing and I'll develop something in, a, in the opposite direction of where they originally wanted for another project or another idea. Uh, it helps like unblock you. Yeah, what, exactly. 
you um you know you have a lot of designs and um in production and you make a number of different designs in your custom work so uh, presumably there are a lot of them that ended up on the cutting room floor or that are just still in sketchbooks waiting to come out what's your what's your process like do you sit down every day and draw or how does how does your process work um it's usually whenever I have an idea, just something pops into my head. So if I if I get an, a thought or an idea, then I will sit down at the computer. I usually uh, work in old, old uh, Bobcad 2D drawing. Um, and I'll get the, the basic design started. And once that design gets started, I will have multiple variations uh, of that. So I will have uh, probably 10 or 12 different files of the same design where I've made little variations uh, and tweaks. And sometimes it's massive variations depending on where my head is at the time. And then I just pick the one that I think uh, is going to be the best choice. And I start working on that, developing it and doing prototypes um, and going from there. So yeah, to your point, I have a lot of stuff in the computer on file that I have not touched. Um, I don't have, I, I don't know if I have enough time to get to a 10th of what I have in the computer. Um, I would love to, because some of them I really, really think I like, but I not sure how well received they'll be. So that's always the guesswork too, is trying to figure out what, uh, you know, just because I like it doesn't mean everybody else is going to like it. Yeah. And you have to sort of, uh have your ear to the ground and be able to predict what <clears throat> what people are going to want in a year when they're actually made or a year and a half or, or whatever. And and not like you want to uh, alter and, you know, you, you want to stay true to you yourself and your designs. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, you, you got to make what the people want. Yeah, that's that's very true. It's um, if you're doing it as a business, as as your source of income, you uh, you are kind of. Uh, beholden to uh the demands of the uh your customer base um you know you can put your ideas out there and if they don't sell you kind of have to go in the direction that uh, they want to go in now if it's purely just being an artist and you really don't care whether it sells or not then you know that's a luxury that you can just go and do what you want to do and if it sells great if not you really don't care yeah yeah good for you <laughs> that, that would be a great you know good good problem to have but in a way you know, to keep the fire stoked in the belly, you kind of need some of that fear of failure, you know, yeah. and and also that, uh, you know, that goal to be reaching for. If, the, if there's no, Absolutely. if there are no stakes, then. Absolutely. You know, no, you, you, you got to have that, uh, that sense of uh, impending doom looming over your shoulder. Um, I feel that all the time, so. <laughs> I think it's called being human. You you were talking about uh, having all of these designs in your computer and then the design process. And uh, the, what really got me, I'm a, I've always been a pen and paper guy. I went to art school. I love to draw and all this. Um, and I love drawing knives. I have notebooks full of them. Um, but what really just got me is when you said that you'll start a design and then you'll do a whole bunch of variations on that design because I'll do the same thing in my sketchbook, but it's such a pain to, okay, I'm going to do the same handle all the way through, but just very, you know, variations, slight variations on the Bowie blade I'm putting on it. And just to redo the handle over and over. And I, I work in a creative field where I'm using a computer all the time to, to edit video. And if something doesn't work, I control Z and I go back, you know, or I can just duplicate it and do it again. And sometimes when I'm switching gears and I'm going into the sketchbook with a pencil, I'm still thinking in that mode of video editing where I can just undo, you know, oh, I hated what I just did. Let's go back to what I had. Oh, I can't, you know, I erased it and now I have to try and redraw it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know what you mean there. That's, that's how I started pen and paper. Um, uh, yeah, I have used to have a notebook uh, full of drawings. Um, I have no idea where that ended up. It disappeared. Uh, there were some drawings in there that I uh, would desperately like to have and, uh, get made because th those were some early ideas that were actually i think pretty good but uh, yeah i know exactly what you mean pen and paper you you go to make that adjustment and you uh i'm a, i'm terrible at drawing uh absolutely hideous at drawing my handwriting stinks I, i'm no good with that so when i get something drawn on 
on paper and I get it looking halfway decent, I am, I, I refuse to, uh, to do any adjustments or erasing to it. Um, I've tried it too many times and it, uh, it never, yeah, it never turns out nice. So once I learned how to use the, uh, the Bobcad and start doing the computer uh, drawing, uh, yeah, I just put all the, the drawing pen and paper behind and stayed on the computer. Much no safer for me. Yeah, yeah. No looking back. I I, I, I admire that. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to get my hands on some CAD and noodle around. Uh, but um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, you had your mentor was Daryl Ralph. May he rest in peace. Um, how, tell me a little bit about working with Daryl Ralph and what what you learned from him. I know, I think we touched on this earlier, but I, I just wanted to bring him up because he, he passed this past year. Yeah. Um, may he rest in peace. Uh, he was, uh, he was definitely a character. Uh, there are no two ways about it. Um, he's uh, <laughs> working with him and, you know, being friends with him was uh, an adventure uh, he had uh, his personality. I, I don't think he was bipolar, but sometimes you thought he was bipolar because he would, uh, he had this huge, huge personality when he was, uh, you know, on a, on a tangent doing something. I mean, he was just all this energy to get this thing going and get it done. And he, you know, it was just like this flurry of activity around doing something. And then, once he got to a certain point in that process that you, you could see him just put on the brakes and stop and calm down and he would switch gears and he, he'd forget all about it. And all that energy was, you know, like, okay, I'm done with that. You know, and it's time to, you know, take a little rest and not everybody works like that. So as I'm going along for a ride and we're talking about things and I'm like, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about the, you know, how the, the blade's going to do this. And he, he just looked at me, he's like, that's all right. You know, we'll, we'll get back to that. I, I want to go and you know, let's go talk about this or let's do something else. I'm like, I, I, I can't, I can't, I want to stay on, on this topic. You got me in there. Um, and you know, that also would translate into sometimes when he was on those tangents, he would get, uh, he would come across as a little moody. Um, so some people would always would take that as, uh, him being just, a sometimes being a, a I don't want to say mean, but just a little surly, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and they wouldn't know how to take him, so he's a little off-putting when he's in those in those modes. So if you didn't know uh, didn't know him, he he could uh, yeah be a little off-putting, and I think that's kind of where some of that character aspect comes from, where uh, some people didn't know how to take him. Um, the people that knew him loved him, still love him, no issues, you know. Mm -hmm. The people yeah. that didn't quite get him, kind of like eh, don't know about him. Uh, but yeah, he was regardless of that, that aspect of it, even the people that weren't too sure about him, huge respect because of what he did in the industry. He was a guy that did a lot of things behind the scenes. Um, he was a guy that could think and see in three dimensions. Uh, so a lot of knife makers would go to him with problems trying to get something to work, uh, you know, a new type of automatic or a new type of a lock. And, you know, they'd, Hey, Daryl, you know, we're doing this, this is what's going on. I get, you know, I'm running into this problem. It's not connecting correctly or it's not seating properly. And he would think about it for a few minutes and come up with a solution just because he had that thing, cra uh, crazy ability to, to think and see in 3d where most people, you know, they have to be on a computer or draw it to think to do that. And because I never had his permission to say who um, I would say, you would be amazed at the list of people in the industry today that owe Daryl some level of uh, thanks for what he did to help him out. Uh, it, it was amazing the phone calls he would get. I mean, he'd be hanging out at the shop and he'd get a phone call. Oh, hey, what's going on? I'm like, who is that? What? No. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, he'd chat for a few minutes like it was, you know, old times, talk through the problem, hang up. I'm like, what, uh, what does he call you? He goes, yeah, he calls me all the time. I'm like, I didn't know you guys were friends. He goes, oh, yeah. Huh. <laughs> Just nonstop like that. And, um, even with uh, some of the production companies would call him uh, and 
talk through some issues um, on de design development. And again, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so he was he was well connected just behind the scenes. You know, I, I got a, a sense that that uh, maybe there was a vibe that that I don't know that there was some friction or something. But he was so cool uh, on our podcast, and my conversation with him was great. And he was such a warm, uh, welcoming kind of guy, and we had such oh, a great yeah. conversation. And and I was definitely, uh, you know, a little bit starstruck over the Expendables knife, and you know, oh absolutely, uh, uh, his work is all. He he actually said this is on my desk all the time. I write with this thing all the time. It's one of his pens. He just, you know, thanks. Thanks for talking to me. Let me send you a $150 pen. You know, oh, yeah. that's, that's, that was Daryl. Yeah. He was, yeah. uh, he was more than generous. I watched him do that on, on a number of occasions. He, that was my first introduction. The very first time I went over to his shop, I think I mentioned, um, I was picking up a custom cause I finally convinced him that it seemed ridiculous to pay. I don't know what 10, $15 to have UPS deliver a, package uh when i was 10 minutes away <laughs> um so i finally convinced him and then that first visit after spending an entire saturday with him before walking out the door he just loaded me up with all kinds of stuff um the designs he did he was doing with camillus at the time uh the ethan becker had a bunch of stuff that uh a bunch of knife knives that he was doing with um k bar and camillus was actually making them at the time so i probably left with darn close to $500 worth of production. Knives. Oh, sweet. He just kept handing them to me. Here, take this. Oh, you're here, here. You're going to want this one. It's like, it's like uh, visiting mom and dad, you know, like, oh, yeah, it, it was it just blew me away that he did that. Cause I, I was just amazed that he spent the whole day with me and we talked you know, talked through his stuff and he showed me around the shop and we started talking about how things were. And then, yeah, just all of a sudden, here, take this, here, take this. Oh, hold on. I got to go get something. He opens up this box and, you know, hands me another knife. I'm like, just like, wow. Man, uh, just, that, it blew me away. Uh, that, yeah, constantly. He was one of the most generous guys I think uh, I've ever known. Well, he will be missed. Um, you know, I... Uh, I'm glad I got one chance to speak with him. I always wanted to have him back on. Never quite worked out. Uh, but uh, I'm glad I got a chance to talk to him uh, that one time. Um, you mentioned on your uh, website, I was I was uh, just reading your About Me um, page on your website, and you're talking about how your dad always carried a folder. And I remember this from our past uh, conversation. But it struck me, you know, you you sort of describe how uh, you got the utility um, aspect from your dad. It's a tool. You carry it on you all the time. You use it for as much as you can. Um, yep. So I see where the utility side comes from. It. Where does your um, interest, excuse me, in the tactical uh, come from? Yeah, I, I know you have some background in security. Is it that? Yeah, actually, that is uh, primarily where that came from. Um, when I was uh, in the security uh working at uh, Nationwide Insurance. And I started out in uniform security. Um, I was collecting knives at the time just because I thought they were kind of cool um, and they were cheaper than buying guns because I was into competition shooting. So it was like, mm. I, I can't afford to buy a new gun, so I'll buy a knife. Um, but as I was, uh, we were going through some of the training and contrary to what you would see on TV, uh, the training we did at nationwide was uh substantially more advanced than the uh the rent a cop stuff um, we actually worked with uh, local police swat um, we did some we did training with uh we had the military come in uh for a couple of uh training sessions um, fbi the director of our security at the time uh was a retired fbi so he had connections so we were constantly getting trained very well and by some uh, pretty reputable <laughs> uh, establishments at the, to say the least and um, we also had uh, CPD officers Columbus police officers that would uh, be available to us that were uh, would do uh, escorts in the evening for uh, employees take them out to their car because the parking lots were all surface lots very far away so they would walk mm -hmm. them out and 
in all that area, we also had a homeless population that was not massive at the time, but they were very uh, colorful um, individuals. And they were known to cause trouble. And it was through the interaction, working with the uh, Columbus police when they were doing their escorts and interacting with the homeless and seeing how the homeless lived, how they carried their life with them and what they did to protect themselves. And there was the one thing that really brought my focus and attention on this tactical aspect of knives was there was a uh, young lady that was homeless, um, very tiny. She was maybe four foot 10, a uh, tiny little thing, but she frequently caused trouble and CPD would frequently pick her up. And one time they picked her up and they went to search her. And when they searched her, they pulled off of her, I want to say six knives, two butcher knives. Uh, one of them was almost a 10 inch blade. The other one was a smaller blade and then various pairing knives and stuff like that, that were just all put all over the place on her so she could get to them. Mm -hmm. And when I saw how she was able to hide those things, being as small as she was and you just it didn't print it didn't show and i i just i became fascinated like how did she do that how how did that happen um and it, it's from those kind of interactions where i i started to really get focused on the tactical application the self-defense application of blades the kitchen knife aspect is is one that comes up a bit in conversation here uh just the fact that uh, uh the, the kitchen knives are, are are you know far and away the most responsible for violent crime uh with knives and cheap kitchen you know dollar store kitchen knives um and and then when we think about uh, we were talking about the pickle style knives that whole pickle um i don't want to call it craze the whole there's a there's a huge element of the pickle uh thing that uh uh you know ed calderon brought out with ed's manifesto with the uh, using the, the the cheap kitchen fruit knives you exactly. know bent, bending the handle with the heat and and you just no matter where you go you can go find one of those in Absolutely. the store pretty easily and just make a uh take a a water bottle and make a little sheath and just melt the water you know he shows how you can do that and Boom, you got something that could drop and not print at all, drop in your pocket. You can pull it out and pull the sheath right off. And and that's the reality. Not so much, um, you know, all the weapons I have around me, at least not in our society these days. No, that's very true. That's absolutely true. Um, it is, uh, I mean, I like to think that uh, what I make, uh, if it is used, it's used correctly by the good guy so to speak um doing you know self-defense defending himself or someone else mm -hmm. uh not being used for any uh nefarious deeds but um yeah I, to you know when i really think about it i uh, i realize that most everything i make 99.9 percent .9 of it is you know, ultimately uh pocket jewelry or you know some cool toy for people to go look at what i got um and, you know, the reality is that uh, the, the real tools, good or bad, are going to be those those knives that you said, the cheap ones that you can pick up at the dollar store. Um, you can lose them. You don't care about them. Yeah. The box cutter, the paring knife, all of that stuff is, yeah, I mean, that's that's what's really used. Um, yeah. And even by the, the people, the pros, the, the people, the good guys still do that. Um, a buddy of mine that I used to work with at Nationwide, he... Uh, he was uh, became special forces uh spent some time over uh in uh bosnia in that area and he would talk about the stuff that he carried and it always uh you know i we, he always talked about wanting to have a randall uh, i think it was the model seven and then some other really nice knives and once he actually got into operating overseas and really doing that stuff. He left all that stuff at home. Uh, his utility knife, the knife he carried with him all the time was a uh, cold steel SRK. 
and the stuff that he had with him as backup were a lot of times the kitchen knives that he would he didn't take them with him he, wherever he went and operated wherever there was a town he would go through and find something locally and pick that up and that was his uh you know backup stuff so because it's cheap you lose it he goes i'm, I'm not going to carry that randall out in the field he yeah. goes that's that's not happening um you know i'm going to carry the cheap stuff if i lose it great so what i don't care um and I don't have to worry about it. And he said the SRK at the time we were, he was in, it was $89 um, out of the carbon V steel. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, he bought, I think he said he had six or seven of them because he would lose them frequently. And uh, yeah, that, that's the reality. The expensive stuff is nice to have. It's great. It's functional. I love making it. I love when people buy it. I think it's, it, it's fantastic, but it's not the reality. Now, just so you know, uh, I do carry this knife. I carry this, not, it, this is not my most frequently carried fixed blade, but I, I do carry this one because it fits my parameters. Uh, it, it goes in the waistband nicely. And now that I've, I've lost a little bit of my, my spare tire, this, <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit better on me. Um, but this, this knife makes for a great uh, uh, stowaway knife in the waistband. And so... Um, I carry this as a collector uh, who likes to carry his knives uh, as many of them as I can, yeah. you know, uh, legally and or, or or at least discreetly. Um, but I do know it's there, and and I you know I've done quite you know some a lot of training in the past in in Kali, and I currently do. Uh, so I, I feel uh, like I can carry something like that uh, as much as most guys and uh and not be walking around with something i don't understand that's why i don't carry a gun not that i don't understand guns but i haven't trained with them like i have with knives so i feel like i can carry knives uh, i've carried gun a few times i have a i have a permit to do so but i don't know i'm just this i get um yeah. so I, I yeah i understand what you're saying um and i do equate um custom knives uh a lot to to handguns um when you look at the various guns on the market uh a wide range uh, some beautiful stuff out there some you know incredibly well engineered stuff that's just grown by leaps and bounds over the years when i was shooting um you know when the glocks first came out they were the pinnacle of uh indestructible ultimate uh tactical handgun and now you look across the board and the Glock is just, you know, one of the guys up there. Um, he's the grandpa, but, you know, no longer is the thing that is uh, catching everybody's attention. But you look at other guns out there that are cheaper, they'll do the same function, they'll do the same thing. And I kind of look at it the same way. Those nicer guns are kind of like the custom knives. You carry it, they do the job better. They're a better tool, but they're not needed it's nice to have you know it's going to function exactly the way you want it you have the confidence in it uh you know it's not likely to break um and uh you know same with the custom knife it's going to function it's going to do what you want it's specifically made to do what you want it's not likely to fail you uh, uh but if you go down a step and you go to the cheaper throwaway stuff it works it gets the job done most people do it because it's affordable if it breaks it might leave you in a bad spot or it might not same with a gun though with a gun i think if you're relying on the gun and it breaks you're you're in a little more of a hard spot but I, I, that's kind of the equivalent i have when i look at that and think about that um you know it's it's still trying to keep a perspective on what i do and what's really going on in the world yeah, well, you're making Ferraris for people who can buy Ferraris, you know. Uh, my my Honda gets me to and from work awesomely. I love that car. Uh, but, man, it'd, be, it'd get me there a lot quicker in a Ferrari. It's just not necessary. But, man, if you can get it and and you like it, it's, it enriches your life. I, you know what I also think? And this is... Uh, this is uh, partly the justifier in me because uh, you have to be a, a rank justifier to accumulate so many knives without uh, without the requisite guilt. Um, but, uh, you know, t 
to me, I think of them as post-apocalyptic currency. You know, I need a bag of rice. Here's a folder. You know, you need yeah. a knife. You need to cut that open here. You take this. I'll take the rice. And so that's why, honey, I can't get rid of any of these <laughs> knives. <laughs> I'm looking for, forward to our future here. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that's a good justification. I like that. You, you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you with don't. you. So um, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier um, the Navaja that I saw at the Beyond EDC table. And uh, as we're wrapping up, I, I want to talk about that design and some of the other designs that you have that are just, just percolating up and are going to be out on the market sometime soon. But first, I want to start with that Navaja, since I love that uh, the source material you're working with. Tell me about the design there. That design actually is... Um... It was an old design for me. Uh, the, the blade style, obviously very traditional. Uh, I made a fixed blade about 2010, 2011 that had that exact blade. Hmm. And the handle was very similar. It had a little less drop to it. It was straighter, a little more uh, true to the, uh, to the original folding of AHA. And um, I always liked that knife. I always liked that design. And I always wanted to make it into a folder and I worked at it over the years off and on trying to get it to work just the way that I want, never quite getting it right. And then I guess it was an epiphany, not uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I just, and I wasn't even thinking about that knife. I uh, just popped in my head. It's like, Oh, that's what I got to do. Um, sat down, changed it, made the adjustments. It did what I wanted it to do. Everything functioned correctly. I got it where I wanted it. Um, and then I needed to find a home for it. Um, you know, at that time, David was just starting, uh, beyond EDC and I showed it to him. He's like, Oh, it's really cool. It's really great. Um, but I can't do that right now. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit with what I'm doing directly. And then, uh, Josh at, uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works, um, we had a conversation because he was doing all kinds of the uh, variations of the proponent that Artisan was making. Mm. And we started talking about doing different things, and I showed him that knife, and he immediately said, yeah, we're doing that. Um, we went to, uh, to David, and David said, yeah, we can, you know, since we have someone that, uh, that wants to, to do this initial run, uh, we'll do it. And we developed it from there. And beyond EDC is making it for Smoky Mountain. So they'll have the, uh, the, the runs when they first come. I, they should be shipping right now. So they should be getting them in their hands anytime. Oh, cool. Uh, they'll, they'll have the G10 and uh, titanium. Um, and then beyond EDC themselves uh, have their own variation of a smaller one. I think the blade ended up being about 3.5. Um, Looks substantially different. I mean, still in Navaja, but uh, I changed some angles and the opening method so there would be no confusion. And uh, David actually had the prototype out at Blade Show West. So I'm hoping that once he gets home and gets settled, he'll send me one of the uh, the samples so I can play with it because it, uh, I think it looks really nice. And I think it's, it is a departure for me. It's, a, it's definitely a different look. Um, I didn't intend for it to be a different look. It was just trying to differentiate it for beyond edc from from what is be, going to be called uh, the night horse uh, for smoky mountain and uh yeah i'm very very excited to see both of them because i i love those knives and my biggest hope is that uh, they sell out very quickly for smoky mountain because if they do then i can talk them into making a bigger version <laughs> oh yes 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 and a navaja deserves a big version absolutely that's uh, that's where they shine <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, they were replacing swords. <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, before we close, I, I, I forgot to mention, you are uh, working on an inversion, and I'm not sure if that's what you're calling it, but you're, you're coming out with another version of this under your own shingle. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Kaiser has, uh, uh, well, I, I can't say 100%. They've said that they're, they've stopped production of the inversion, um, and I'm still waiting to hear a final 100%. Yeah, we're, we're done. Uh, if they are 100% done, then this new knife, I'm going to 
continue the name on my knife as the inversion. Um, but what it is, uh, it's basically the same knife. I've changed some of the blade shape a little bit. Um, and I've also changed the handle shape a little bit to give it more of a true utility feel. So when you hold it in a uh, edge down, edge uh, point forward orientation to do, you know, some of your normal cutting like that, your hand will fall naturally into the handle a little bit better. So it won't look quite so awkward, even though it's not awkward when you actually put it in your hand, it doesn't look intuitive like it's going to work. Right. Um, so this new design has changed a little bit. So your hand, it looks like your hand will fit in there and it'll function in that, uh, in that way, but it's still going to maintain all the other aspects of it. It's going to open with the flipper. There's going to be a uh, wave opening or I can't use that term. I'm sorry, yeah. pocket opener attachment, um, uh, for it. And, um, it's also going to have an adjustable pocket clip so you can adjust the height of the pocket. Oh. Clip. Uh, that's cool. So, that's always been one of my things about deep carry pocket clips is it's, you know, for, in my opinion, for a true tactical knife, if you're going to use it in an emergency, a deep carry pocket clip doesn't, when you draw it, doesn't put your hand in the optimum position yes. to open the knife. It needs to ride a little higher. And so I, on this design, I've given people that option. If they want to mount the clip lower, they'll be able to mount it lower or higher, depending on what their preference is. Cool. Well, great. I'm so glad uh, that you're going to be carrying on the inversion if uh, if and when Kaiser uh, uh, stops production on it because it's such a such a cool knife and it's got so much potential across a lot of different uh, realms. Dirk Pinkerton, thank you so much for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Really great to catch up with you. And uh, I can't wait to see the stuff you have coming out uh, for me, especially the Navaja. Thanks. I, I definitely appreciate being back on. I really enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I definitely uh, hope I can come on again sometime. All right, cool. Sounds good. Talk to you later, sir. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Dirk Pickerton. Uh, be sure to keep your eyes peeled for his latest designs from your favorite uh, manufacturers, especially this Navaja, as I keep saying. But also do yourself a favor and check out his custom work. Uh, go to his website and uh, or go to you know, get him on Instagram because the fixed blades he's making are incredible. And he's got uh, massive respect from his peers. So uh, definitely, definitely worth a look. And also worth the money. Uh, do yourself a favor also and check back in with us next Sunday for another great interview. Wednesday for the uh, midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives right here on YouTube. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast